The 1920s were a decade of sweeping change. The aftermath of World War I saw economic booms and the growth of a new consumer culture. In a few short years, the nascent film industry saw explosive growth thanks to the efforts of Hollywood as well as cinematic movements in Europe. An early German film that would prove to be perennially influential was Nosferatu, a symphony of horror. Nosferatu was a 1922 silent film in the German Expressionist style, directed by F.W. Murnau. It was an unauthorized adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, although most changes were small, and the movie still largely follows the novel's events. Some of the names, including the titular vampire, were changed, some think for copyright reasons. Being that the film was made for German audiences, it might have just been to make the story feel more local and tangible. Even with the alterations, the filmmakers were sued by Stoker's heirs, and all copies of the film were court-ordered to be destroyed. Fortunately for film historians and fans, several copies survived and ensured Nosferatu's place as an important part of cinematic history. It's 1838. In the fictional German town of Wisborg, Thomas Hutter is sent to Transylvania by his employer, the estate agent Herr Nock. He is to visit a new client named Count Orlock. Herr Nock has recommended that Orlock purchase a large estate across the street from Hutter's home. Hutter travels to Orlock's castle. Along the way, he encounters locals who are disturbed by his plans to meet the Count. Hutter finally arrives by coach and he is welcomed by Count Orlock. While eating dinner, Hutter accidentally cuts his thumb, which drives Orlock to attempt to suck the blood out, repulsing his dinner guest. The next morning, Hutter wakes to discover puncture wounds on his neck, which he blames on mosquitoes. That evening, Orlock signs the documents to purchase the house and he becomes obsessed with the portrait of Hutter's wife, Ellen. Observing that she has a lovely neck. Later, Hutter is reading from a book on the supernatural he found at the local inn and starts to suspect that Orlock is a vampire. Midnight approaches and he can't bar the door, so he retreats to bed. The door swings open and Orlock enters. Hutter falls unconscious. Meanwhile, back in Wisborg, Hutter's wife Ellen rises from her bed and in a trance walks upon her balcony's balustrade, attracting her host's attention. A doctor is called and when he arrives, she shouts Hutter's name, apparently able to see across the miles to Orlock in his castle, threatening her unconscious husband. The next day, Hutter goes exploring the castle and below ground finds the crypt and coffin where Orlock sleeps during the day. That night, Hutter looks into the courtyard to see Orlock piling up coffins on a coach and then climbing into the last one. He moves at a supernatural speed and the lid is placed by apparent telekinetic power. The coffins make their way down river to port and are taken aboard a sea vessel. Amidst the voyage, the ship's sailors start dying off apparently due to a plague infecting the ship. Eventually, all sailors, including the captain, meet their deaths ostensibly at the hand of Orlok, a plague manifest himself. When the ship arrives in Wisborg, Orlok escapes unobserved, carrying one of his coffins, and he moves into the mansion across the street from Hutter and his wife, Ellen. An outbreak of deaths descends upon Wisborg after Orlok's arrival, which the town's doctors blame on an unspecified plague. Ellen reads Hutter's book on the supernatural, which claims that a vampire can be defeated if a pure-hearted woman distracts the vampire with her beauty. She opens her window to invite Orlok in, but collapses. Hutter revives her, and she sends him to fetch Professor Bowler, a physician. Ellen is now alone. Orlok enters the room and takes Ellen. Lost and consuming Ellen's life force, Orlok is distracted and unaware of the hour. Orlok is caught and destroyed by the sunrise, vanishing in a puff of smoke. Ellen dies in the embrace of her grief-stricken husband. The movie closes on the destroyed castle Orlok, symbolizing the end of Nosferatu's reign of terror. Silent filmmakers overcame a series of challenges to effectively impart their message and ensure that movies would become a dominant storytelling art form. Nosferatu effectively managed a variety of different disciplines and skills to achieve this goal. Exaggerated facial expressions and gestures are often used to impart meaning. These performances likely come from a more theatrical tradition. 
captions are used for exposition as well as dialogue. We also see the use of books as expositional tools as well as plot devices. Color is used to symbolize a variety of themes, including black for death as in Ellen's apparent widow's garments and an etiquette of mourning when she feared that Hutter had died at the hands of Orlock. Orlock's black clothing representing death and or evil, in contrast with his white visage and hands, indicating death, a state of bloodlessness, or extreme anemia. By extension, this also indicates that he is diseased. Orlock's coachmen and horses are all in black, and the horse's head covering almost has a hangman's vibe. Ellen's white nightgown indicates her purity, making her a suitable temptation to lure Orlock and hasten his death at sunrise. Nosferatu also makes use of whole frame tinting where you'll see color used to indicate the time of day, lighting, or the mood. Nighttime tends to be kind of a blue purple and interiors with firelight or even daytime scenes are more of a sepia or brown. Count Orlok's physical appearance is one of the most iconic in movie history. Orlok is gaunt, angular, sinuous, demonic, and alien in appearance. His protruding ears come to spear-like points while his fingers take on the shape of tentacles. His teeth and mouth can only be described as carnivorous and predatory. Orlok's coachman bears striking resemblance to his master, with dark circles around sunken eyes and pale white skin. Hernock has an exaggerated disheveled appearance to indicate his progressive mania. Other basic makeup effects include the bite marks. Many of the camera shots are set up to allow the action to proceed across the set while the camera remains static, sometimes towards, away, or across. In some cases, the camera is moved overly close to exaggerate movements, such as the schooner bobbing in the sea. Most scenes don't involve more than one or two camera positions. One of the rare moments in the movie, the camera actually tilts up to follow the crewmen going up the deck. Although visual effects were limited at the time, we do see some double exposures to indicate Orlok's wrath-like state, as well as a film negative effect likely to indicate the transition into Orlok's realm. After dropping off Hutter, the coach hurries away, which is achieved with accelerated film speed. As Hutter arrives at the castle, the gates appear to open and close under their own power likely achieved by a hidden crew or a remote pulley system, and another indication of Orlok's supernatural powers. Orlok's quick loading of the wagon and telekinetic powers are achieved by sped up film and stop motion. Stylistically, although it's considered a German expressionist film, it's not as pronounced as Dr. Caligari, for example. We have creative use of shadows, light, color, gothic elements, but not quite as severe with the angles and disproportionate geometry and perspective. Many themes that derive from Stoker's novel are addressed in Nosferatu, including fear of the other in various forms, such as race, belief systems, and sexualities. There was considerable public concern about the occult, infectious disease, uncontrolled lust and sexual predators, psychological disorders, and mental illness. Death is a pervasive theme symbolized in the colors, costumes, creatures, and events. From Ellen's etiquette of mourning to the procession of coffins down the streets of Wisborg, Death's Shroud covers the entire film. Nosferatu and the rats both symbolize carriers of disease. The director had been in World War I and had contracted a disease while in the trenches. The Spanish flu epidemic of just a few years prior was still in the public consciousness. In the film, blood is a metaphor for life and Orlok is like a parasite or infectious agent carrier. Boats were also seen as possible vectors of disease, especially as they were the primary means of transportation between continents. Bats could also be seen as vectors of disease. Diseases were part of the larger natural world and the unifying elements of nature included the beauty as well as the bestial. Despite the progress of science, the utopian Garden of Eden couldn't prevent the serpent's intrusion. Folklore and mythology are often ways of dealing with real problems, and it's fascinating to find that many of the issues that Nosferatu symbolized are the same concerns we would have as a modern audience. The other can take many forms, race, religion, political belief, sexuality. Fear of the other doesn't appear to have diminished in the centuries since the movie was released. 
As filmmakers, there's much to learn about the craft from this movie. As an audience, we can still see much of ourselves no matter how much time has passed.